Uh, welcome, my name is Rabbi Judith Kempler. I'm the Outreach Rabbi here at Temple Beth Am. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you this evening for our second Sokol Speaker Series of the year. Uh, I just want to explain a little bit about how the evening will work. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction and then we'll have Howard come up with Sharon and introduce our speaker for the evening. During his speech, I'll be passing out note cards. So if you have questions as he's going through his lecture and discussion, feel free to write them down. I'll be collecting them and then I'll present them to him for our Q&A. Um, so anything outrageous that you say, I can just, you know, just kidding. So to give you some background, Howard and Sharon Sokol initiated the Sokol Speaker Series in March 2007 in honor of the memory of their parents who encouraged them to see the world through Jewish eyes. The series is modeled after the 92nd Street Y in New York in hopes of bringing challenging, provocative, informative information to the community they call home here in Miami. This series' intention is to explore the state of Israel, both internally and externally, as well as the broader politics of the Middle East. Former speakers have included Rabbi Michael Melchior, former Maimad Knesset member, Israeli education and social justice advocate, and I learned today, Chief Rabbi of Norway, Lawrence Wright, author, screen and playwright, journalist, and Pulitzer Prize winner, Robin Wright, author, journalist, and MacArthur Foundation grantee, Dan Senior, author, television commentator, and businessman, and Izzeldeen Abulaish, Palestinian doctor and author. Through their efforts, Sharon and Howard have enhanced our community's understanding of and connection to the complexities that exist in the Middle East at this time in history. They have gifted all of us with access to relevant writers, journalists, and activists, both here and abroad. It is my pleasure to welcome Howard and Sharon to the podium this evening to introduce tonight's guest speaker. I think Books and Books is a real treasure in our community. Um, I don't mind paying a few extra bucks for, for a book because of all the things that Books and Books does for this community. Obviously, we'd like to thank Temple Beth Am, all the rabbinates, Rabbi Judy Kemper, who just introduced us, uh, Shari Demowski for all of her support, um, Michelle Cohen, who has been there whenever we've had questions, she's been there to answer them in such a nice, nice way. I'd like to thank all of you that forgave or decided not to watch the Miami Heat play tonight. <laughs> I'd like a show of hands of how many people are taping the game. <laughs> Me too. Um, and my job, my real job, is to introduce the real president who is going to introduce our speaker, Sharon Sorbonne. Howard, thank you very much. Um, we're delighted to be able to sponsor this um, series so often and your commitment, because all of you take the time and make the effort to come, are we able to do this? Um, in keeping with our goal of trying to present information um, about the Middle East, specifically Israel, as Judy said, both internally and externally, I have the privilege of introducing tonight's speaker, Ken Ballin. Ken has more than 20 years on the front lines in law enforcement, international relations, intelligence oversight, and congressional in investigations. We got to hear a little bit about that tonight at dinner, and indeed, he has quite a long list of experience. He's the president and founder of Terror Free Tomorrow, which is a nonpartisan, not for profit organization that investigates the causes of extremism. He's a regular contributor to CNN. His articles have been published in the Washington Post, Financial Times, Los Angeles Times, Foreign Policy, Wall Street Journal, and the Christian Science Monitor, among others. Ken has also prosecuted figures in organized crime. And when he talks to you a little bit later about terrorists, he, he likes to live a dangerous life. 
um, international narcotics in one of the first cases in the United States involving illegal financing for the Middle Eastern terrorists. He served as counsel to the House Iran-Contra Committee under Chairman Lee Hamilton, where he was the lead investigator responsible for questioning key witnesses during the nationally televised hearings. Among other assignments on Capitol Hill, Ken has served as chief counsel to a bipartisan Senate Special Investigative Committee with Senator John McCain, and as chief counsel to the House Steering and Policy Committee, where he directed policy in initiatives on crime prevention and security, intelligence oversight, and select national security matters for the U.S. House of Representatives. Terrorists in Love is the product of Balance five years of interviewing more than 100 extremists throughout the Muslim world, many of whom he had met in Saudi Arabia's Ministry of Interior Care, Interior Care Center, a rehab center for jihad, jihadists. For a Jewish boy, that in itself is quite a feat. So with that, I warmly present Ken. Thank you. This is quite a privilege to come here. We got a great turnout, uh, and uh, uh, I'm happy to uh, talk to you all. Most of all, uh, I wonder, do you think we need the microphone? Yes. yes, all right. No one has ever accused me of talking too softly, so, uh, you know, if it gets too loud with the microphone, let me know. Uh, that's never a problem. Uh, I, I look forward to talking to you, and I most of all look forward to the questions, uh, because always when I get the questions, I get such interesting feedback, particularly from this book, and particularly um, from a crowd like this tonight. I'm sure you all have uh, fascinating questions, so I, I look forward to it. Uh, let me start with this. People often say to me, terrorist in love, what kind of title is that? What is that about? Well, first of all, this book is not a policy book. This book is not an analytical book that tells you, you know, here are the causes of terrorism and here's what U.S. policy must do. Something very different. In fact, it's never been done before. This is the intimate life stories of six Islamic terrorists and jihadi who went to fight in holy war. And when I say intimate, I mean intimate you will find from their ancestry, their family background, their grandfathers, their grandmothers, their mothers, their fathers, the relationship they had with these people. What formed them as young men, because we're largely talking about young men, and how they became <clears throat> radicalized. And then, as importantly for some of them, how they left the radical cause. Because that's something that we're often missing in this war on terrorism. Not everyone goes and comes back. And, you know, I, can't, I, I should quote a review that recently appeared in the Huffington Post. Not because it was a good review, it was a good review. <laughs> but because it, it, it said something very in, insightful, I thought, that I hadn't necessarily thought of. Which is that it's almost more important to know why people leave as to know why people join. And the misconceptions that we have when it comes to these men, are greater than the understanding that we have. So, terrorists in love. Why terrorists in love? Well, the book tells the story of a young couple in Saudi Arabia, a young man and young woman, who do what young people the world over do. They fall in love. But in Saudi Arabia, it's very different when you fall in love. Can everyone hear me all right? How about in the back? You all, everyone's good? All right. Young man and young woman fall in love. They're teenagers. He goes every day to her window, literally. That's why they're called the Jihadi Romeo and Juliet. There's a reason for that. He goes to the window, her window, and serenades her every day. He uh, makes all kinds of presents for the kids that they're going to have. He recites poetry to her, and she writes poetry for him. And they fall madly in love. Every day they, his grades drop in school and he's at her window and she invites him inside and they fall uh, in love like a Romeo and Juliet. Five years this goes on. The young woman turns 20 years old. Time to get married. 
Time to get married in Saudi Arabia is a very different deal than you might think of. It's a business transaction. Her father, she tried quite an attractive young lady at, at 20 years old, he wants the dowry, the bride price for Miriam. The bride price in Saudi Arabia at that time was around $20,000. This young man, his name is Abdullah, or Abby for short, doesn't have that kind of money. He manages to save up $8,000. Miriam thinks this would be a good down payment. He can give that. That's the way. Um, this is a down payment to marry her. He can give the down payment to her father, and then over time he can pay the rest of it. Her father and her elder brother have different ideas. They found him, find a man who has $30,000, $10,000 more than they were hoping for. He can pay that all up front, get these down payments, and marry Miriam. Miriam does something extraordinary, something unheard of. She's presented with this ultimatum. She slices her wrist with a razor. She says, I will not do it. I will not marry someone I don't love. I want to marry Abdullah. They take her to the hospital. They take a cousin of her, dress her in the full length of Aya, so they don't, no one knows who she is. And they bring her before the Imam, the Islamic religious leader. This cousin pretends that she's Miriam, marries the man. He's 60 years old, 60 plus years old. Miriam's 20. She's a fourth wife for this man. He pays for her. Miriam is in the hospital, and Abby goes to her in the hospital and is distraught. And she tells him, well, there's nothing you can do. I'm married. And her brother visits Miriam in the hospital and says, Miriam, you have a choice. Either you go off, now you're legally married. If you leave your man and go off with Abby, you'll be arrested and stoned to death as an adulterer. Or if you refuse and leave us, you can be disowned right now and on the street as an orphan and uh, meet the consequences. She goes off with the man. Abby is distraught. He takes his car to the edge of town and goes up to a cliff and thinks, I am going to take my life because I'm losing the love of my life. But as a devout Muslim, the greatest sin he can do is suicide. Because in hell, he will repeat whatever act he did to kill himself on earth. So if he drives his car off the cliff, he will fall in hell for an eternity and keep reliving the, the, the suicide. If he took a knife to himself, he would keep stabbing himself in hell. So he does the only thing he can do. He goes to a rock to fight in holy war. Because if he dies for God, he will go directly in heaven. And here's the deal in heaven. He can marry whomever he wants. He can marry Miriam in heaven. Miriam, too, later escapes from this man, goes off, because she's not the typical young Saudi girl. She's not going to follow what her father is telling her. And she goes off to Iraq, too, to die. So she has this same notion that she can meet Abby, her love, in heaven. They can't get married on earth, but they can get married in heaven. Terrorist love. There's another young man from Saudi Arabia. His name is Ahmad al Shayed. Ahmad grows up like a typical kid in Saudi Arabia and kind of like a typical boy anywhere in the world. He has a very difficult relationship with his father, who rules with an iron hand. He, he strives for freedom. He's close to his grandfather. He's very close to his mother. He joins a gang. They go around town and they do things that any kind of young man who's lost his path in life would do. You know, they race cars, and they do all the Saudi style, which is kind of strange when they look at um, uh, uh, young women, it's always from afar because they're not allowed to talk to women. Uh, that's the way that society is set up. So he, he joins this gang and finds it very unsatisfying after a while, and then tries to find work. He can't find work. He can't find any work, which is not atypical in Saudi Arabia. Although it's one of the richest countries in the world, with over a quarter of the world's oil resources. Half the young people in that country cannot find work. Employment rates are 50 percent, so like an overwhelming welfare state. So he can't find work, um, and he begins to go to the mosque to try to find meaning. 
and he hears the radical preachers from the mosque, and he meets his cousin who was in the gang with him and who had left the gang. And then the two of them watch the internet. They see the pictures, if you all recall, from Abu Ghraib of the torture, and they feel like this is what they have to do to be good Muslims, to go off to Iraq to fight in holy war. And they go off, this young man, Ahmad, goes off for a lot of reasons. He has a difficult home life. He has a, has a path in life he's, he's lost. But he actually goes, to be honest with you, the same way many young people in the United States might join the Army or Marines because he thinks he's doing it to serve God and defend his brother Muslims. So he goes out of a sense of belonging and out of good motivation. He arrives in Iraq. He's there with 25 other young men from all over the Arab world. And the leader of Al-Qaeda gets before them and is exhorting them to suicide missions. He tells them that the most noble thing you can do is to die for God. This is what God has called you on earth to do. Not to live, but to die for God in a holy war. And he says to these young men, they're 25 and all, how many of you will want to volunteer to go on a suicide mission right away, which is your most noble calling? And not a single hand goes up in the room. Zachman tells me later, look, I was going there to fight, and I knew if I died, I'd go to heaven, but I was in no hurry to get there. <laughs> so, what happens to him? He goes in, in, in Iraq, and he's kept in isolation, basically. They're, they're, the, the, the men are moved from safe house to safe house while there's fighting going on. They're not trained in how to uh, fire a weapon. They're not trained in anything. He's kept in total boredom. And he keeps asking his al-Qaeda, he's become increasingly homesick. He keeps asking the al-Qaeda leaders, make sure you call home and tell my parents that I'm all right. He's feeling guilt. He's feeling homesick. Finally, four months of this goes on, he's, he's in utter boredom, and he's begging for to do something on a mission. And he finally is taken to Baghdad, and he said, we'll give you a mission, my son. And he begs the Al-Qaeda leader, please tell my parents I'm all right. And they said, don't worry, soon as you get back from this mission, we'll, we'll call home and assure your parents that you're safe in our hands in Iraq. So he's driving in Baghdad with two other Iraqi jihadis in a tanker trailer truck. And it's the first time in four months that he's been in Iraq that somebody's actually talked to him and conversed to him, and they're joking around, as young men would do, driving through Baghdad, and about a thousand feet before a concrete barrier. He didn't even know how to drive this tanker trailer truck. And they said, don't worry, we'll drive it for you. And about a thousand feet before a concrete barrier, the two Iraqi jihadis jump out of the uh, truck. Ahmad is paralyzed. He doesn't know what to do. He has to grab hold of the steering wheel because otherwise the truck would go out of control. Grabs hold of it. Less than 20 seconds later, the truck is remotely detonated. It contained 26 tons of liquid explosives. Eight people were killed. Scores injured. But miraculously, somehow this young man, 19 years old, Ahmad al shayeh survives the attack. He's the first suicide bomber to survive this attack in Iraq. His body is decimated. It's covered with burns. He, his hands are burned away, both hands and the fingers are actually melted like melted candle wax. His feet are, 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 are burned apart. He's covered and burning. Um, some Iraqi passerby, from, he had a fake ID on him, as most of the Al-Qaeda guys in Iraq have. They mistook him for a Shiite. They brought him to a local hospital. As soon as he got there, he confessed right away. The Iraqi security came, tortured him. Um, uh, and it's quite graphic, and it's described in the book, and I, and I won't tell you now how they tortured him. It was pretty gruesome. He then, uh, several days later, was taken to Abu Ghraib. And he's absolutely petrified, because he has nothing in his mind but those pictures that we all know of the torture. And he gets there. And instead, what happens to him? He's given 30 operations by the American Army doctors, skin transplants and cellulite, um, uh, skin grafts and cellulite transplants. He's given physical therapy. He's given uh, uh, emotional counseling. Most of all, and he tells the American interrogator everything he knows about Al-Qaeda, 
Most of all, though, an American Army medic, a young woman from Texas, takes care of him and nurses him back to health. It is the first woman he's ever met outside his own family. Never met a woman before. Never met an American before. As he says to me, Al-Qaeda, who I went to fight for, my Muslim brothers, who I went to defend, to give my life for, treated me like a piece of rotten meat. The Americans I went to fight against treated me with kindness and respect. He became fiercely pro-American in his heart. He was transformed by the experience. Terrorists in love. We turn to Pakistan. <clears throat> Pakistan, in many ways, has become the center of Islamic radicalism in the world. A young man in Pakistan, his grandfather, helped to found Pakistan as a Muslim state. A secular Muslim state, people forget that. They found it as a home of refuge for Muslims, but as a secular state, the founders of Pakistan and Muhammad, not a religious state. His grandfather was a secular man, helped to found that country as, as a, in 1947. His father, very secular, rises to become a colonel in the Pakistani army, guarding that country's nuclear weapons. Pakistan, as you all know, is the only Muslim country with nuclear weapons. He's responsible for guarding them. This young man is sent to a secular school. When he is 11 years old, he is raped by the headmaster of the school. Raped by the headmaster of the school. It's obviously a devastating experience. Several years later, he too falls in love with a young woman from afar, which is the way it's done in that culture, because you're not allowed to talk, you're not allowed to converse complete segregation of the sexes. But he does fall in love, which is forbidden to do. He is, in effect, humiliated and beaten as a result of this attachment or desire. He's raped again. He relives the rape, in fact. His father will only talk to him in English, will not even talk to him in the local language, will absolutely scorns religion, he goes and finds the only solace he knows how to find in that society. He goes to the mosque. He sneaks there. He goes after school. Because he's sent to a prominent uh, uh, preparatory school inside Pakistan, an army school. Army. And he goes, sneaks off to the mosque. In five years' time, he becomes what's called a Hafiz. He memorizes the Quran by heart, knows every word backwards and forwards. His father insists that he goes to secular university, not pursue religious studies. Indeed, hits him when he finds out that he's doing this. He goes then to the University of Peshawar in Pakistan, which is the, the, in the Pashtun part of the country. And the Pashtun make up the Taliban, who are fighting us now in Afghanistan, and make up largely the radical movement inside Pakistan. He becomes increasingly radicalized because he wants to be a good Muslim. This is his desire in life to be more and more devout. And to be more and more devout means to become more and more radicalized. Because you're going further and further down the path to being a good Muslim. He joins a cell that later bombs the Marriott Hotel in the capital of Pakistan. So these are not nice guys. These are quite violent guys. Anyway, he and I spend a lot of time together. You've got a picture of this guy. He's really something of a sight. He's six foot three, six foot four. He wears the whole jihadi uniform. They have a uniform, long white robes. It's cut at the ankles. It's uh, he's got the turban, long beard. Hey, to me, it could have been Bin Laden I was talking to. This guy wore the whole nine yard jihadi uniform. And after we get done, a very long day of, uh, of interviews, of talking, we go down to the restaurant. And the, the Pakistani restaurant in this hotel was full. So we had to go next door uh, to the uh, Arab restaurant. And this devout Muslim never had had Arab food before. So first thing he does is he asks the waiter, is the food halal? You know, that's the Muslim 
kosher. I felt like it. Is the food kosher? <laughs> I don't know that that would have gone over too well, but anyway, I mean. So he asked, is the food halal? All right, that's not enough that the waiter assures him halal. We've got to get the chef coming out from the kitchen. And then they got another chef coming out from the kitchen. And this goes on for about a half an hour. We, we, you know, and finally, he's, he's, he's satisfied, all right, this must be halal. Um, and I did not ask if it were kosher. Um, so he, 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 we're eating this food. And this may seem like an insignificant detail, but it's actually quite important. Because as we're eating this food that he's never had before, I remember a dream that I had this morning. Now you've got to remember, as I, either Howard or, or, or Sharon said, I think Sharon said, I had interviewed over 100 of these guys at length. Radicals, terrorists, extremists. I interviewed double that number, but some would just give me speeches. You know, you know I've listened to some of It's a waste of time. There's a lot of rhetoric. So, but about 100 of these guys I got to interview in depth means hours and hours, days, weeks. In the six portrait in the book, this went on for months and followed up with him over a series of years, in fact. So I'm immersed in this world, and I had this dream that morning, and eating the hummus and the baba ganoush and that other uh, uh, Arab food, which I very much like, I told this man, rather naively, frankly, in hindsight, a dream that I had. And he became very quiet. And he started asking me very specific questions about the dream, like where exactly it took place, and like any dream it was kind of vague, it alternated between a restaurant in the Washington DC area called the Jerusalem restaurant, and then be in Pakistan, and it goes back and forth, he goes, ah, Jerusalem, okay, and then I start talking about the dream, and there's a horse flying in the sky, and blah, 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 and he starts asking me very specific questions, did you see the man's face in the dream? What man's face do you see in a dream? No, I didn't see the face. Did you see how he was dressed? This, that, and the other. So we go through this for quite some time. And he becomes very quiet. He doesn't, he doesn't say anything. Minutes pass like this. It's quite awkward. I don't really know what's going on. And all of a sudden, at the top of his lungs, he shouts out, Allah Akbar! Praise God! Everybody in the restaurant turns around to look at him. He's already a sight to begin with. Allah Akbar! Praise God! You, a Jew, had the dream I've been waiting my whole life to have. You, a Jew, saw a vision of the Prophet Muhammad. And because you did not see his face, that means you had a true dream from God. If you said to me that you had seen his face, I will know that it was the devil that implanted this dream inside you. But because you didn't see his face, it's a true vision. Well, all I can tell you is, thank God I didn't say I saw his face. <laughs> anyway, so I, I, I did not see the face. Believe me, that was the vision from God I had that night. Um, did not see his face. Then this man, on the spot, on the spot, began reciting verses from the Quran, the holy book of Islam, calling for love and tolerance and brotherhood. And this went on for quite some time. Look, these conversations with these guys go on forever. You have to have infinite patience to do this line of work, believe me. They, this is not, these are not quick conversations. They, 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 they like to talk a lot. So this went on for quite some time. But the net effect of this is because a Jew could actually see the prophet for the first time in this man's life, he saw a Jew as not the enemy, not the devil, but a human being deserving of respect. He left his violent cohorts. He joined, he joined a very kind of fundamentalist group in Pakistan, a very, very strict religious group, that, very missionary in orientation. But he renounced violence. He renounced violence. I met another man in Pakistan. This man, this, was, this is an extraordinary story too, because this man was the seer to Mullah Omar. Mullah Omar, as you know, is the leader of the Taliban. He's been the one we've been fighting for 10 years in Afghanistan, not Bin Laden, it's Mullah Omar. Mullah Omar commands the Taliban. He is their leader. 
This man, when he was 16 years, years old, he was in a refugee camp inside Pakistan, as many of the Afghans were, the Pashtun Afghan who formed the Taliban. It's an ethnic movement as, as, as well as a religious movement. He was in a camp, and a leader of the Taliban came. This was when the Taliban first started as a movement in 1996. Came to the camp and recruited the young men. They were 16, 17, 18 years old. And at first, none of them wanted to join. But this man, Malik is his name, had a dream that night. And in the dream, he saw two things. He saw all the young men turn into girls. Yeah, so they know they had to go and fight as a result. And he also had a vision of a man wrapped in, you know, in white. Aha! He saw Mullah Omar, the leader of the Taliban. This is the way the Taliban interpret the dream. The Taliban Mullah, who had recruited them at this madrasa inside, religious school inside Pakistan, and brought all 400 of these boys in to fight uh, inside Afghanistan. And he brought Malik to meet Mullah Omar because Malik had the dream that foretold Mullah Omar wearing the cloak of the Prophet Muhammad, which is kept in Kandahar, which is the stronghold for the Pashtun in southern Afghanistan. This is a holy relic. It hadn't been worn in some 75 years, but Mullah Omar wore it. And because Mullah Omar wore it, the Pashtun gave him religious authority and think of him as their leader because he was able to wear this cloak. Okay? And Malik saw that in the dream. Malik. So he had a privileged position inside the Taliban. He became a commander of the religious police in that country. At 19 years old, he commanded the whole entire eastern Afghanistan. 19. We, we invade after 9-11. The Taliban are pushed inside Afghanistan. This is an inside account of what happens. They go to Quetta in southern Pakistan and take up refuge there. And if you remember that first year we were fighting, we weren't fighting because it was calm. There was peace. Why? Mullah Omar was in Quetta at a madrasa waiting for a dream from God to tell him whether or not to lead holy war. Now some of the uh, uh, some of the fellow deputies were getting a little frustrated with this, I think. They finally brought Malik to him, and Malik gave Mullah Omar a vision that he had. And the vision was that he saw, Malik, uh, saw Mullah Omar's beard turn into a blinding white. Um, it was so strong in the light that every, everyone had to back away. And then the cries of Allah Akbar, praise God, went up, and they interpreted that dream as meaning that Mullah, Mullah Omar's beard took on the cloak of the Prophet Muhammad. And this meant that the Americans had to be repelled and that holy war must start. Lewis, you can't make this stuff up. <coughs> um, and, and we're, our official, by the way, official United States policy now in Afghanistan is not to defeat the Taliban. That's not our policy. Our policy is to put military pressure on the Taliban so that they come and negotiate with us in good faith and we can leave with honor or grace. This is official United States policy. And this guy's waiting around for dreams about what color his beard is going to be and whether God is telling him to fight. This is the inside story. Anyway, so I'm with this guy, Molly, who's deeply devout, very religious. And he begins to tell me about the corruption of the Taliban. Mullah Omar, he still reveres. But the corruption, they're stealing oil, they're stealing money, they have Swiss bank accounts. These are supposed to be men from God. Worst of all, they have an alliance with the Pakistani army, the ISI, which funds the Taliban, and I'll talk about this in a minute, funds the Taliban and protects the Taliban leadership inside Pakistan. This is our ally in the war on terror, the Pakistani government. This is our, the United States' foremost ally in the war on terror. Anyway, but for Mali, this is a dastardly betrayal. How can you be allied with these godless generals that are part of the Pakistani war. So he begins to leave the Pakistan, the, the, the Taliban, and he experiences the corruption and the duplicity. And so I think, wow, here we go again. Here is this moment of this man who's never met an American before, never met a Jew. He's sitting, talking to me about the corruption. I, I, I have this tremendous hope in my heart again 
you know, like some of these other, like the man in Iraq who meets the young American army medic and, and the other man with the dream who, who actually renounces violence because he finally saw the enemy as a human being and I'm thinking, wow, this is extraordinary. And he reaches out to hold my hand. That is extraordinary. Mullah Omar won't even look at an infidel. One time in, in the Taliban when he was ruling that country in Afghanistan, a Chinese delegation came to meet with him and he wouldn't look at them because they're, look at them because they're infidels. They gave him a gift of some Chinese vase or whatever, and as soon as they left, they destroyed, the Taliban destroyed the gift, because Mullah Omar wouldn't even touch something that an infidel would touch. This man reaches out to hold my hand, which in Pashtun culture is a sign of friendship. He's holding my hand, and he proceeds to tell me the following. He says, the Prophet Muhammad told us that the day of judgment will not come until every Jew is killed. And if the Jew is hiding behind a rock, the rock itself will cry out, O oh, true believing Muslim, kill the Jew that is hiding behind me. If the Jew is hiding behind a tree, the tree will cry out, kill the Jew that is hiding behind me. He only if the Jew is hiding behind a Garkar tree will that tree not cry out, because a Garkar tree is the tree of the Jews. He proceeded to tell me how in Afghanistan they were uprooting all those poor trees so the Jews wouldn't have any place to hide. Well, um, he's holding my hand now, and he's telling me this, knowing that I'm a Jew, and I only have one thought in my head at that moment. Let me the hell out of here. <laughs> anyway, I, it was interesting that I, I told this, this story, which is recounted in the book, to somebody, and they said, well, in his kind of twisted view of the world, he was still holding your hand in friendship. What he was doing was warning you that unless you convert to Islam, you're going to be dead. So, not everybody changes by their encounter. Some don't. In fact, this man, Mali, became even more radicalized because he left the Taliban. They weren't radical enough for him. And he was also part of that Marriott bombing. And God knows how many terrorist acts he's responsible for. He became even more convinced, more convinced of the righteousness of the cause. So it's not as simple as going and meeting with these guys and opening their minds. Uh, that doesn't always work, as I can attest. Uh, let me, should I tell more from the book? Or should we open it up to questions? Let me just talk about Pakistan for one moment, because you gather from some of these stories that a lot of these men are devout young people. Well, they're not all like that. One man I met told me the following. He said, there's a lot of money to be made in this jihadi business, and we're making it and you Americans are funding them. This is a man who spent 20 years as a career terrorist for Islam. Those are his words, not mine. Participated in assassinations and bombings and acts of terror throughout Pakistan. He became very disgusted with the widespread corruption of the leaders and began to move away from it until he was hired by the Pakistani army, the ISI which is the secret Pakistani intelligence agency. Since 9-11, the United States of America has given the Pakistani government $20 billion. $20 billion. Because they're our ally in the war on terror. Well, this man told me, and I was able to corroborate much of the story, he told me, you Americans are literally funding both sides in the war on terror. You are giving $20 million to the Pakistani army, and what are they doing with that money? I am training terrorists. He trained 5,000 a year for the Pakistani army on the payroll to go and fight against us inside Ta Afghanistan. He smuggled weapons inside Afghanistan to the um, Taliban. Most of all, leadership of the Taliban was given sanctuary and protection by the Pakistani government, who we are paying $20 billion to inside Pakistan to fight against us. We are literally fighting. Can you imagine in World War II if we gave $20 billion to Hitler? I mean, this is what we're doing. This is, not, this is what we're doing. He told me in 2008 that the Pakistani ISI was harboring bin Laden. He told me it would be like if bin Laden were in Coral Gables and he said the general Miami area. That's how close he was to where bin Laden was. He, in Abbottabad is where bin Laden was found. 
Abbottabad. Let's talk about Abbottabad. In that very city, this man met with an ISI man and a top Al-Qaeda man figuring out how to try to smuggle some suitcase nuclear weapons out of uh, Russia into the hands of Al-Qaeda. Right in the same town. Right up the road from this town. Right up the road is an area called Mansara in Pakistan. In Abbottabad is the Pakistani military academy. In Mansara is the big terrorist training camp. Everybody knows it's there. This man was the head of this camp, training 5,000 terrorists a year to fight against India, to fight against us in Afghanistan, right down the road from where bin Laden was being kept. And we're to believe, and he was told directly that the Pakistani, by an ISI man, who used to run the ISI, that they were uh, protecting, they knew that bin Laden was there and they were protecting him. Meanwhile, we're giving them $20 billion. So we are funding both sides in the war on terror. But these are human stories in this book. These are stories from child, from grandparents. We see how these people grow up. We see what influences them in their minds and their hearts. And people walk away with this from reading this book, and I really urge you to read it, because it is not, I can't, my opinion of it, or what it means, may be very different from yours, because it's the raw material of the inside of these people's lives, what really motivates them. It's a scary world. It's a very scary world. Some of these people are dedicated to their death and our death. What was remarkable, though, was how many people, when they were actually exposed to a human being from the other side, some of this just melted away. It's very easy to hate when you have it as an abstract thought. It becomes very more, much more difficult when there's somebody across the table from you and you've developed some rapport or seen them as a human being. And we saw that in some of these cases. In others, it didn't matter at all. Let me open it up to a lot of questions. Or I have to read a lot of questions, one of the two. Uh, you know what I could also do? Why don't I read a small little portion from the book? Would that be? Would you like me to do that? Uh, yes. All right. Do you want questions or should I read it? What? Questions. Uh, most time they want me to read. But this is a tough crowd. I don't know. All right. All right. And then I'll read a paragraph. Yeah. All right. All right. You're going to test my, uh, my eyesight. Okay, the first question is, how did you find the men you interviewed? This is three questions in one. How did you find the men you interviewed? And how did you gain their confidence so they will talk openly with you? Uh, there, there, there is, there, there's no one way that I found them. Um, uh, Howard and um, Sharon and I were talking about this at dinner. I founded in 2004 a nonprofit organization called Terror Free Tomorrow, and the purpose of the organization was to try to understand what made people join extremist causes, largely the Islamic extremist cause, because that's really the threat we face. Uh, and one way we started this was doing public opinion polling in some of these countries that was never done before, to gain a sense of what people thought on a broader, more scientific level than just anecdotal. In the course of doing that, uh, we achieved some notoriety in some of these countries. For example, in Pakistan, we did a poll at a very critical point in time, which showed uh, a, a displeasure with uh, the general who was the dictator of the country at the time. In fact, he held a news conference denouncing our organization by name and me by name, which made me a folk hero inside the country. So um, it was a great favor. And I got to know a lot of journalists inside the country in Pakistan. And it was through these journalists who introduced me to radical clerics and also to some of these men that I met, the ones in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, this is dangerous work. One of the people who has helped me the most in this was killed last May. Um, so this is not um, easy stuff. But that's how I got to the people in, inside Pakistan and Afghanistan through these journalistic context. In, um, in, uh, and, but unlike a journalist, I wasn't on deadline. 
uh, so I could spend a lot of time with these people. My background is as a federal prosecutor and a congressional investigator, and I uh, uh, interviewed uh, people for great length in my job. I interviewed people in organized crime. I interviewed child molesters. I interviewed um, hitmen. I interviewed drug dealers. Colombian cocaine case, one of the first in the United States. Those guys were not nice guys. Uh, I uh, also did a, a case, Palestinian terrorism case. It was one of the first cases I think uh, Sharon mentioned. It. Um, uh, this was the uh, PLO back in the 1980s. So I had a lot of experience interviewing bad guys. I've interviewed thousands of them. And when you're a prosecutor and you interview people, you don't interview them for a day or two. For example, in one mafia case, we arrested around 50 people in the initial rounds of the arrest after listening to their conversations on wiretap with the FBI for over a year. And then once I had those people, about half cooperated, and it was at least another year or so of interviewing them over months, daily, everything about their lives, uh, that we went and prosecuted even more people. That's the way it's done as a prosecutor. That's the model, and that was the model for my organization. Understand by in-depth interrogation, in-depth analysis, not superficial. Journalists are on deadline. But anyway, so I met, that's, that's my skill set. And in Pakistan, we met these, I met these people through um, uh, journalists that I came to know. In Saudi Arabia, it was a little different. Um, I befriended uh, one of the uh, generals who was responsible for counterterrorism inside that country. And he let me inside. I was one of the few Westerners who gained access, and I gained more access than anybody else um, inside their uh, terrorist rehabilitation center. And I met two of the guys portrayed in this book through that, and then the third through other channels inside Saudi Arabia. And I gained their confidence because I have experience doing this kind of work, interviewing bad guys, interrogating bad guys. Um, and, you know, to be honest with you, there were other factors as well. Like that Pakistani uh, uh, terrorism career guy, I mean, as soon as I sat down with him, I couldn't get him to shut up. It just flowed out of him. It was like being in a confessional. He, he felt so much guilt over what he did that just flowed. Other people I had to extract from information, but for many people, um, you know, there were two factors at work. When you're part of a religious cause, you're do you feel like you're doing something right, and you want to justify what you're doing. And also, I found this with criminals, too. Many of them want to confess because they feel guilt, like that guy who came calling. And lastly, because I was an outsider, because I wasn't part of the tribe, they felt like they could open up to me and not feel the humiliation and shame that they would among their fellows. So it was almost like a psychiatric session, if you will. They all knew I was writing a book. And as I mentioned earlier, not all of them opened up. You know, you, you will read about the six who did. But I never intended to write a book. These stories, when I came across these guys, were so compelling, changed everything I thought I knew as a so-called expert on this subject, that the book wrote itself. Why would you talk to these people candidly? Why would these people... Well, that's the same question that I have. Um, you know, m many of them hate Americans and Jews, but th that, that was actually a very provocative thing in the interview. It was, I wouldn't open up with that. But at some point when I gained their confidence as a fellow human being, they didn't know it beforehand, like that group that wanted to lure me away from the hotel and do another Daniel Pearl. They had Googled me and knew that I was Jewish. Um, so they wanted to do that. Not that I would go away from, you know, not that I'd be that foolish, but they wanted, that was what was in their mind when they, they set out to meet with me. But, you know, it was very provocative to tell them that because they don't have a very high opinion of Jews and this would get them going. So it actually was helpful. Actually helpful. Okay. Did I need an interpreter? And how did you set up the meetings? I set up the meetings. I, I explained how I set up the meetings. Um, two of the fellows inside Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, I, I, I speak pidgin Arabic. So I couldn't conduct the interviews. I had an interpreter. There, the interpreter that I had, I had one interpreter, and I also had their psychologist. This man was a Saudi. He went to the University of Edinburgh. And I don't know whether I'd want him as my psychologist, 
But he uh, openly told in these meetings, come on, Ahmed, tell, tell me about how your father abused you. <laughs> and, you know, and, all right. So he openly encouraged both of these guys. Without him present in these meetings, I would never have gotten the kind of information I got out of those two guys. In Pakistan, Mali um, I spoke only Pashtun, and I, I worked with a journalist and translated. The other two fellows I interviewed, Shahid, the man who, with the dream and all of that stuff, he spoke fluent English. Don't forget, he, he went to a top school in Pakistan, was taught only in English. His father only spoke to him in English. He um, spoke English entirely fluently, as did that other fellow who came from a very, the one who worked for the Pakistani government. He also came from a very wealthy family inside Pakistan and went to the top preparatory school in Pakistan. Uh, it was a Christian school and they only spoke in English. Yeah. And then the third Saudi spoke fluent English as well. Third Saudi is a member of the royal family and I could talk about that in a minute. Man, it might be interesting. If you think I should, I will, but let's answer some more questions. <laughs> Is there any difference between radical Muslims who believe that the world must convert to Islam and evangelical Christians who believe that unless you convert to their form of Christianity, you will not be into the kingdom of heaven? Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I didn't interview Christian extremists. So, um, I, I really can't answer that. But, uh, you know, um, uh, next. <laughs> What should be the uh, U.S. policy in Pakistan? Um, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. It's a very common. The more you know on these issues, the less you're able to really give prescriptions that are simple and, and, and to the point. Um, I think it's a very look. I will tell you what this guy said. who worked for the ISI for the Army in Pakistan, training terrorists to fight against them. He said, "Cut them off." He said, "They're keeping Bin Laden. They're keeping the Taliban because they're making lots of money off." Them. Cut them off. Don't give them one penny, and then you'll see what happens. Now, our official policy of the United States is that we don't want to do that because we want to keep a line of communication because we don't want them to become more radicalized. We don't want them to turn to China. We don't, you know, we want to know where their nuclear weapons are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Meanwhile, they're taking their nuclear weapons. They're taking their nuclear weapons on trucks and moving them around the country without any safeguards whatsoever because they don't want us knowing where they are. You know, I, I can't give you an answer whether the American policy as we now do it is, is the right one. I think if we follow this guy's advice, it's kind of high risk, but maybe he's right. He knows these people and he thinks they're playing us. And certainly after $20 billion, what do we have? They didn't help us find Bin Laden. They harbored Bin Laden. They're not helping us defeat the Taliban, they're harboring the Taliban, they're protecting the Taliban, they're giving them arms, and we're giving them money. I don't, either we should be fighting to win or we should not be there, but we shouldn't be fighting both sides. Next, so I didn't, I don't know whether I answered that question, but your book states that torture is not effective, yet it has been widely publicized that KSM broke down under waterboarding. Um, I, I don't accept that premise um, that he broke down under waterboarding. In fact, I don't think that's true. But torture is not effective. Um, I was a prosecutor for many years. It's almost a model. You've got two TV shows for those who watch. And since you don't watch basketball games, maybe you've seen these two TV shows. You've got 24, Jack Bauer beating people up and, 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 and they're confessing. And then you have the other show, um, uh, Law and Order, where the cops befriend the people and nice to them and all that kind of stuff. Let me tell you, as a, a prosecutor who interrogated tons of criminals, that's the way it works. That's the way it works. Torture does not work. Torture makes people give false information. Yeah, you get information. Like the guy we tortured, Al-Qaeda guy in, in Egypt, where we gave it to the Egyptians and they brutally tortured him, far worse than anything we would ever even think of doing. They really tortured him. And so he said that um, Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. He said that Saddam was allied with Al-Qaeda. We used, this was the intelligence we used to invade Iraq. From this guy we tortured in, or farmed out, subcontracted to the Egyptians to brutally torture. And what the guy said later on, look, I knew that's what the Americans wanted to hear. 
that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction and that he was in alliance with bin Laden and al-Qaeda. So I said it. So the torture would stop. That's how torture is effective. But any, you know, torture started, it wasn't the FBI who did it. After 9-11, torture, the, the, the CIA, this was formed out to a bunch of amateurs who had never conducted a criminal investigation in his life, came up with this torture program. It's the work of amateurs, not professionals. Why do we continue to fund Pakistan? I think I answered that question. I gave you why we officially... What is the philosophical difference between Shiites and Sunnis? I don't really feel equipped. You have nuts on both sides. Anyway, that's the unofficial answer. <laughs> Other than that, I can't get into the religious distinctions. Weren't you afraid that they would kill you when you told them you were Jewish? Um, no. No. But, you know, there was a review of the book in Foreign Policy, which is a uh, noted uh, journal by one of the top experts in Pakistan. And she said, Ken was either an idiot or naive, but anyway, we can thank him for the story. So I, I, I can't, that's, that's her reaction, so. Um, I, I can't read it. I, I have two problems when trying to read these. My glasses are for long distances, so that's, that's one problem. I'll, I'll try Okay, has there ever been any other culture in the world where the parents have joyfully offered their children for suicide missions? How can you accomplish anything with people of this mentality? Well, I, I think this suicide stuff, I interviewed lots of these guys who went and fought in Iraq. And um, you'd be surprised how many are manipulated and lied to in the suicide missions. The in Intrinsic human instinct to live is very powerful. And many of these young men are deceived into this. Um, and that is a weapon in the war on terror that we haven't played. The corruption and the duplicity of the leaders of the radical movement has gone unreported and largely undetected. You know, I don't know whether many of you remember this, but after 9-11, Osama bin Laden in December 2001 gave an impromptu talk to some of his followers, which was taped. And during this talk, bin Laden starts talking about the so-called muscle hijackers on 9-11. These people were from Asir, which is a province in the south of Saudi Arabia that most Saudis look down upon. And he's talking about these young men and he's laughing. They didn't even know it was a suicide mission until they were on the planes. They'd never been told. And he thinks this is quite funny, that they were deceived like this. Why wasn't that tape continually played throughout the world in every mosque? Uh, I'll answer in a second. There was another person. We killed Anwar al-Awlaki in Yemen in September of last year in a drone strike, if you recall. This fellow was an American citizen. When he lived in San Diego, he was arrested and convicted three times of soliciting prostitutes. In fact, there's a statement of him in open court admitting to this. This is an unknown fact in the Muslim world. Unknown fact. I dare say that if we had gotten that kind of facts into the right hands, and disseminated it widely, that would have been more to damage the radical movement than killing him, which makes him into a hero in people's eyes. Um, I, I'm supposed to read the question, so I'm, I'm going to be, I'm, I'm in shul, I'm going to be a good, uh, good boy and read the questions and not take them from me. In the 50s and 60s, the U.S. foreign affairs agencies identified potential young leaders in other nations and brought them to the United States where they enrolled in universities and visited various industrial and cultural sites. They met artists and ordinary Americans. They learned what our democracy was. Our go government no longer has these programs. Do you think they should be resurrected? Absolutely, without doubt. Talking, you know, nobody had talked to any of these. These guys never met an American, never met a Jew. And I had this experience through in other countries as well when I talked to these guys. You know, the human interaction, bringing them here, it will not change everybody. There's the famous story of this guy, Saeed Qutub, who was a real radical nutcase, 
um, in Egypt and part of the Muslim Brotherhood and wrote a lot of these radical uh, uh, books that, um, that um, uh, Bin Laden later followed on Al-Qaeda. He came to the United States and was so appalled by our loose morals, he became even more radicalized. Just like that guy, Malik, I interviewed, who you know became more radicalized when exposed. So it's not going to change everybody, but I think for the vast majority of people, we should. Our young students should go over there. Their young people should come here. That kind of dialogue is essential. Look, you're not going to change everybody's mind by talking, but by refusing to talk, you're surely, surely not going to change. We, we're conducting policy without knowing who our enemy is and what they really think. We, we're blind. We're blind. By the way, since this is a group who... who I just want to mention a fact. You know that, that, that Malik, that Afghan guy who told me every Jew is going to be killed when the Day of Judgment comes? This is a saying of the Prophet Muhammad. He's not making this up. And in fact, it's in Hamas's charter. You read the Charter of Hamas, why they exist as an organization. So when people ask Israel to negotiate with Hamas, they're negotiating with people who, as a matter of their deepest faith, believe that every Jew must be killed. Not every Israeli, even. Every Jew must be killed. This is the word of the prophet. It's the word of God. So next time someone tells you that Israel should negotiate with Hamas, ask them if they've read the Charter of Hamas. Why Hamas exists? Look, I know I've met with these guys. They're not, this is belief. This is deepest faith. This is not something they're going to negotiate about. And that's why we're negotiating with the Taliban. It, it's an utter ridiculousness. We spent over a trillion dollars. We've lost 2,000 of our young men and women. Tens of thousands injured to negotiate with people who as a matter of religious faith believe we should be dead. Does that make sense to you? And we've given them $20 billion to boot. I don't know. People ask me what should be our policy. I can't tell you. But I don't think this is a policy right now that makes much sense. That's because we never go over and talk to these people. We don't know what is in their minds or their hearts. But it's not all bleak. There's some hope, but it's pretty bleak. I got one, two more questions. What makes you want to become... Uh, I, I can't... Maybe you can make it. I, I don't know that I'm an expert. I, I went and talked to these guys, um, which is more than the so-called experts who you hear on the television here do. I mean, I don't know how you understand people if you never go and talk to them. I mean, ask, next time you see these people, the so-called talking head, have they ever talked to a single terrorist? Very few have. Uh, Peter Bergen, who wrote the foreword to the book, he was the first Westerner to interview Bin Laden. He has. He gets it. But very few people do. Now, look, it's risky business. I mean, people die doing this. So, I mean, you know, maybe that's why they don't do it. But then, I don't know how much you can listen to them. But what's unfortunate is our policymakers make policy, not understanding uh, who they're responding to. Uh, um, you want to help me with this? Sure. Uh, did everyone hear that? No. As the number of Muslims in the world grow, and there's over a billion of them, um, and more and more presumably attached to these kind of radical beliefs, what will be our future? What will be the outcome? I, I didn't tell you about, I'm going to answer this with a short story. Do I have time, Howard, or not? All right. But he's leaving. <laughs> And then, no wonder I have time, he doesn't have to listen to me anymore. Um, I'm going to tell you a story that, that's in the book that I didn't tell you, which I think kind of answers the question. One of the young men in the, in, in the story is a man by the name of Kamal. Kamal comes from a very privileged 
family inside Saudi Arabia. You have the royal family in Saudi Arabia who runs the country and owns the oil, the Al Sauds. They stay in power though, not just because they're the royal family. They stay in power because they're in alliance with the family of Wahhab. They're the real royal family in Saudi Arabia. They are the descendants of Muhammad Wahhab who founded the puritanical sect that is of Islam that's practiced in Saudi Arabia, in which where Al-Qaeda and all the radicals get their doctrine from. It all comes from this. This young man is a member of this family. They're part of the government. They're part of the royal family. It's one of the only families, two families inside Saudi Arabia that royals are allowed to marry. This for this Wahhab family. So he's a descendant of the Wahhab family. He is also a terrorist of love, but you can read the book and find out what happens to his love life. But he, should I say? No, no. So, yeah, there's got to be some mystery. You've got to read the book for some things. Anyway, so he uh, becomes radicalized. And he is on the verge. He's got his own, he's a young man in his 20s, but he's got a bank account that he's got access to uh, in Vienna from a Swiss bank with a branch in Vienna of $143 million. And he knows how to give that money over to Al-Qaeda and the Taliban because people inside Saudi Arabia give money to Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. He knows how it's done. He can do it. And he was on the verge of giving a large part of that fortune over. That would have been a game changer for us. The 9-11 attacks cost about $500,000. Bin Laden's complete fortune, highest estimate, was $10 million. He blew through that by the middle of the 1990s. He didn't have a dime after that. It's a myth that he was walking around with lots of money, not have a lot of money. $143 million, or a portion of $100 million, $43 million. That's enough to buy a black market nuclear weapon. You see, Pakistan gave their nuclear technology to Iran and North Korea for a song. So it's a precarious line between success and failure. But this young man went through a process where he turned against the radicals. And he could be in a position of influence in the future. So there's hope and there's a lot to fear. And the line between success and failure, the Pakistani nuclear weapons. You know, people often ask me, what keeps you awake at night? Ken? Well, as this man, Zeddy told me, who was paid for by the Pakistani army to commit acts of terror. Terror. He said, these are people you meet in the international conferences. They talk the Queen's English. They walk the democratic walk. Yet they are true believers underneath their uniforms and underneath their suits and ties. And would sooner slit your throat as to shake your hand. And I've met some of these generals, and usually they're younger, like colonels or whatever, in some of these countries. And when you peel away the outside veneer, there are a lot of true believers among them who have access to nuclear weapons. That's what keeps me awake at night. That's what keeps me awake at night. Can I take She's been wanting to ask a question. Some of them were, yes. How could they not realize that they were just, they didn't know how to land the plane? I know, well, you have to distinguish between um, um, uh, the, 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 the leaders in the plot all knew what they were doing. All the ones who piloted the planes, all they all knew what they were doing. They had on 9-11 uh, about eight or nine young men in their early 20s who were brought along, they were called the so-called muscle hijackers, just to kind of provide backup to the main guys, to keep the cabin under control and keep, you know, the passengers from doing what they did on the Flight 93 Atlantic, that crash landed in Pennsylvania. Um, so that's why they were aboard. Maybe, I, I don't know the precise number of them, or nine or ten of them. Those were the ones that Bin Laden was referring to. They weren't told it was, a, they were told they were going on a holy mission. They weren't told it was a suicide mission until that it was, there was no turning back. So he didn't deceive any of the leaders, only the, the, the kind of hired help, if you will. Um, but this is common. This is not, you know, this is a myth that people willingly go to their death. There are some people who do, 
but many of them are, are manipulated into. And the story of Ahmad is, is not atypical. I encounter that many times. Sometimes they do, that's another. Sometimes they don't, I, you know. Um, and sometimes they, 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 they think they're in heaven and, you know. There's a lot, there's a lot of reality, there's a lot of, you know, the, the radicals want you to believe and they want other Muslims to believe that this is the way it works. But this is not what I found. And I found well, the families of these young men did not want them to go and did not believe they were going to heaven. And many of these young men are lied to. And th this is not exposed enough. Um, this is not exposed enough. Am I supposed to just take questions now? Or? No.